That show business follows the day's news now from the South East on BBC One with Tim Hewitt and Gwenan Edwards. Murdered in their own home, police ask who'd kill a couple in their 80s. Looking for peace on the tube, but is it too late to stop the strike? And fighting asthma without drugs, but is a Russian cure just quackery? Good evening, we start tonight with the murder of an elderly couple at their home in West London. Joseph and Cornelia Plosch, originally from Poland, were both in their 80s. They were found bound and gagged in Fulham. Police say robbery appears to have been the motive, although they had little worth stealing. The man leading the investigation called the attack brutal, callous and cowardly. James Cameron has our report. Number 72 Hurlingham Road was still sealed off today as forensic experts continued their hunt for clues. The dead couple came to England from Poland after the war. This photograph of them was taken in 1947. Next door neighbour Diana Wilson called the police on Saturday, worried that she hadn't seen them around for almost a week. They kept themselves very much to themselves and as I say, we saw them in the front garden but that's about all we did see of them. They were quite friendly and polite and that was about all. Police discovered 86-year-old Joseph Plosh tied up in bed with a pillow over his face. His 82-year-old wife was lying in the kitchen. She too had been tied up and suffocated, but also had facial injuries. Hurlingham Road is a quiet residential street near the Thames in West London, and the double murder has left many local people feeling profoundly shocked. It's a very quiet street. It's a friendly street, but not a chatty street, and it, it was quite a shock to hear what had happened. This is what came home to me. I mean, if we'd been here the weekend, it could so easily have been us. Police believe the burglar or burglars broke into the house through a ground floor bathroom window. Crime statistics show that attacks on elderly people in their own homes are extremely rare. Today the police appeal for anyone who knows anything about the murders to get in touch. It's at least possible that those responsible for the attack will have confided in or boasted even to somebody about what they've done. And there can be no excuse whatsoever for shielding these perpetrators of this horrific crime. And I would ask that anybody who's got any information on this matter to come forward and talk to us. Roses have been placed on the bonnet of the couple's car outside their house. The windscreen was broken at the weekend, but police aren't sure if the damage is connected to their deaths. Police are also investigating the murder of a man close to where Mr and Mrs Plosh lived. The victim, who was in his mid-forties, was found stabbed to death at his home in Ranley Gardens this morning. But police say there's no evidence to connect the two cases and there were no obvious signs of a break-in. More details are expected once a post-mortem has been carried out. Hopes the rising of averting Thursday's strike on London Underground. Both unions involved in the pay dispute have agreed to talks at the arbitration service, ACAS. The RMT began discussions this afternoon. The drivers' union, ASLEF, which has called the stoppage, announced a short while ago it would join them tomorrow. We'll be getting a live update in a moment. First, this report from our transport correspondent, Simon Montague. ASLEF's chief negotiator emerging from talks this morning with an invitation to go to the conciliation service ACAS in a new effort to break the deadlock. ASLEF will be consulting its executive committee members on that proposal. Meanwhile, the 24-hour strike scheduled for Thursday and three days next month are still going ahead. The two sides are split over new working arrangements attached to a pay offer of 3.2%. The dispute is the latest evidence of a crisis of morale among drivers. Newsroom South East has obtained an internal report, prepared jointly by managers and unions, spelling out more than 20 areas of grievance. Causes of low morale, which both sides agree to examine, include overstressful working conditions, grossly unfair disciplinary procedures and inadequate safety equipment. Meanwhile, London Underground is hoping that the drivers' union will agree to postpone Thursday's strike while a peace settlement is hammered out. I hope that if we get around the table quickly with ACAS um, and we do move towards some kind of arbitration position, that this whole dispute will be put on ice while we, while we resolve this peaceably. I think it will be a great sadness if we, they have to actually stop the trains before they get into that position. 
Tube managers arrived at ACAS headquarters this afternoon for more talks with the second driver's union, the RMT, whose members are also being balloted for industrial action. But leaders of the ASLEF drivers weren't there and won't meet conciliation service officials until tomorrow. The union added that there was no prospect of another face-to-face -face meeting with London Underground, so Thursday's strike still looks set to go ahead. And Simon Montague joins us from ACAS now. It sounds a little bit pessimistic. Simon, are you expecting no tube trains to run on Thursday? It doesn't look good. While the meeting here between uh, the RMT, London Underground and ACAS has been going on for more than three hours and looks like running well into the evening, that's not really the point. The point is that ASLEF are not here, that although they will come here tomorrow, they're only prepared to meet ACAS officials, not London Underground. And that, of course, means that if ASLEF does call the strike on Thursday, they have got uh, by far the majority of train drivers and they will bring the network effectively to a stop. Is there a chance a week or two down the road that there could be a strike involving both unions and effectively a total shutdown of the tube? Well, I mean, that is possible towards the latter part of July, but frankly, it doesn't really matter whether the RMT join in or not. ASLEF has 2,000 drivers. The RMT has only 1,000. If ASLEF calls a strike, traditionally they're very solid. Many RMT members probably wouldn't cross a picket line, and I think merely for safety reasons, London Underground wouldn't attempt to run anything more than a token service with an ASLEF strike alone. So whether or not we see the RMT really doesn't make much difference as far as commuters are concerned. Simon, briefly, what's your reading of the mood of the staff on the underground because there was a series of strikes last year it was a rather bitter dispute and it didn't actually go very f uh, le lead anywhere did it as far as the, as far as the strikers were concerned no it was a, there was a long long dispute last year although there were only three one day strikes the dispute itself went on for four months uh, I think this time it's very much the drivers uh, who are at the centre of what's going on and it's not a debate about pay, it's a dispute about uh, new working arrangements and I think as that report that I referred to uh, earlier said there is low morale among drivers and clearly that now is, is coming out to the fore and is at the centre of what's going on in terms of this industrial row. Simon, thanks. Tube latest, we'll keep you posted. Gwenon. A 16-year-old South London girl and her teenage friend are being held in an Italian jail charged with smuggling heroin worth £600,000. They say they're innocent and according to British officials in Naples, they had been collaborating with police. Marianne Platt and Melanie Jackman were arrested in Rome after arriving with a Nigerian couple on a flight from Istanbul. Here's Amanda Harper. At the British School of Performing Arts in Croydon, there was disbelief today that a former pupil had been arrested on suspicion of smuggling drugs. Marianne Platt from South London left ten months ago with a promising career ahead of her. Today, staff refused to comment on her arrest. Security guards were posted outside to deter unwanted visitors. Marianne left the Brit School last August with 12 GCSEs. Said to be a bright girl, she had hopes of becoming an actress or a teacher. It now looks as though that dream has been shattered. Marianne, pictured here at school during a visit by John Major, was thought to be on holiday in Greece. In fact, it was a different story. Italian police say Marianne and her 19-year-old friend Melanie Jackman had flown from Istanbul in Turkey to Rome Airport. They were arrested after customs officers found 10 pounds of pure heroin hidden in the linings of two shoulder bags. The police then struck a deal. The deal was that the girls would take the financial police to the place near Naples, which is about two hours drive from Rome, from Rome airport, where the meeting with two Nigerian suspected drug dealers would take place and they followed behind and as the bags were handed over with the heroin inside, the arrest was made. Marianne is being held in a juvenile detention centre outside Rome. Her friend is being held in a women's prison near Naples. The teenagers have already been visited by the British Vice Consul. There's no bail in the sense of a financial deposit as there is in the UK. It will be up to the magistrates to decide whether or not either girl could be let out on provisional liberty pending trial. Tonight, as Marianne's mother was preparing to fly out to Italy to be with her daughter, it was revealed that both girls had been offered $4,000 each to smuggle the heroin into the country. Another two-year delay in finishing the controversial extension of the British Library in London was announced today. It'll now open in 1999, ten years behind schedule. The chairman of a parliamentary spending committee called it an appalling failure. This from our political correspondent, Jonathan Beale. Not yet open, but the British Library at St Pancras already has a big enough history of failure to fill a book. Its costs will exceed £500 million, three times what is budgeted. 
and an uncomfortable civil servant and chief executive of the library admitted to MPs it would only be fully open much later than planned. June 1999, sir. June 1999? Before it's all open to the public? Yes, and to readers. That's a very long delay, isn't well, it? Yes, we are. The MPs heard firsthand how kilometres of cabling had to be replaced after being installed and that the original shelving had jammed throwing books to the floor. The committee's chairman said the delays at one stage had been costing the taxpayer one and a half million pounds a month. I do hope that you will be taking, when this is uh, settled down, when this has settled down, that you will be taking action to make sure that the taxpayer does not pay for the errors by the contractors themselves. In all, he said it had been an appalling case of failure, but those in charge of the project say the problems are now in the past and that though long overdue, the British Library will be open at the turn of the century. Jonathan Bale reporting from Westminster. And coming up in News from South East. Why a doctor says one of London's biggest nightclubs should be shut down. Treating asthma without drugs is the Russian way, cure or quackery. And camping out for Wimbledon as Jeremy Bates takes his final bow. But first, the owners of the Earl's Court Exhibition Centre today admitted a breach of safety laws following the collapse of a stand during a Pink Floyd concert. 36 people were injured. A structural engineer and a seating contract were also in the dock. The court was told it was an accident waiting to happen. Here's Andrew Hoskin. 15,000 fans of the supergroup Pink Floyd turned up for a spectacular concert at Earl's Court in West London. Instead, they witnessed a near disaster. A stand supported by scaffolding collapsed, throwing more than a thousand people to the ground. 36 people were taken to hospital with minor injuries. At the time, eyewitnesses were astonished that no one was killed. People started falling on top of us from behind. All the chairs tipped forward and there was just a mass of twisted steel and uh, people screaming. When you look at the way that those stands went and the way that they crumpled, I mean, it really is a miracle that nobody was killed. Investigators for Kensington and Chelsea Council accumulated enough evidence to bring successful prosecutions against three defendants, including Earls Court Limited, the owners of the exhibition centre. At Knightsbridge Crown Court today, all three pleaded guilty to serious breaches in health and safety legislation. According to prosecuting counsel Philip Colville, a catalogue of errors by the three defendants meant that collapse was inevitable. They'd failed to ensure public safety by agreeing to modifications to the structure that meant it was seating more than three times the number of people it could cope with. In mitigation, Jonathan Kaplan QC, acting for Earls Court Limited, said the company had consulted fully with Kensington and Chelsea Council on the seating plans and modifications. The sentencing of all three defendants is expected tomorrow. Doctors at a London hospital are demanding the closure of a nightclub after two deaths within two years from taking ecstasy. Staff at St Mary's in Roehampton say they're having to treat more and more youngsters who've collapsed on the dance floor at Club UK in Wandsworth. But the club insists they're doing their best to crack down on the dealers. Sarah Morris reports. Last October, the police raided Club UK in Wandsworth because they believed there was serious drug dealing going on there. It's a huge venue where dark, cavernous rooms pulsate to the sounds of rave music. Most clubbers here, like those everywhere, say their only high is drawn from the sounds, their energy for dancing fueled by just water and soft drinks. But medical staff at the nearby hospital, St Mary's in Roehampton, tell a different story. Every weekend they have to treat young people brought from the club who have collapsed after taking ecstasy. Most weekends we see at least one, and it's usually two or three. They always come in in the small hours of the morning, between sort of three and four in the morning. I'm not trying to spoil their fun, but when we see people going, young people going on a ventilator and surviving, or coming in dead, as happened in, in one case we've dealt with, uh, one gets very concerned. Dr Thurston has appealed to Wandsworth Council to turn down the club's application to have its licence renewed. The police also want it to close. After the raid, they claim the floor was littered with ecstasy tablets abandoned by clubbers. Then in January, a 19-year-old student, Andreas Buzis from Finchley, died in the club after taking the drug. The second death there in two years. Club UK is one of the biggest of its kind in the country. Around 2,000 clubbers pass through here every Friday and Saturday night. 
The management says it leads the way in in-house security. Most clubbers are searched before they go in, there's a CCTV camera in operation inside, and plainclothes security officers mingle with the dancers. We, through the systems that we employ there, are certain now that to 90-95% that we have dealt with this problem. We feel that it is controlled. We now happily rely on the local authorities' evidence as recently as April of this year, showing that there is no problem with this club. Paul and Janet Betts have become familiar faces in schools in the southeast since their 18-year-old daughter Leah died after taking ecstasy last year. They want to get the message through to teenagers that the drug is highly dangerous and can kill, but they say simply closing venues where it's likely to be taken doesn't really solve the problem. We can take Leah's case. Leah's, it was her 18th birthday party. She took it at home. Ecstasy is a group cultural thing and obviously the more people you get, the more ecstasy will be used. But it's a case of education and making sure premises are properly run. Wandsworth Council will decide whether to renew Club UK's licence on Wednesday. If it's refused, the club's management say they'll appeal. In other news, a fire in London's West End caused serious problems in this morning's rush hour. More than 40 firefighters tackled the blaze at Cambridge Circus. Shaftesbury Avenue and Charing Cross Road were closed for several hours as checks were made on the building. There were no injuries, but arson, and arson is not suspected. London Underground has relaxed its penalty fares policy following protests from passengers. A penalty of £10 was introduced two years ago as part of a crackdown on fare dodgers. But there was an angry response from season ticket holders who'd forgotten their cards. They said they shouldn't be punished for their forgetfulness. Now LU has said it will accept that as an excuse, but only once a year. Next tonight, fighting asthma. It's a condition that's affecting more and more people. Now there's a new technique to combat it. But is it cure or quackery? It was developed by a Russian doctor, but is dismissed by many in the medical profession here. The method uses breathing control rather than drugs. Our health correspondent, James Westhead, has been investigating. 6, 37, 38, 39, 40, OK. <laughs> The Briteco method claims simply that asthma sufferers breathe too much and with training they can reduce their asthma attacks. Did you have any attacks? No. The theory is that breathing too much reduces levels of carbon dioxide which keep the lungs open. When they use this method they are able to reduce their breathing and make their breathing more normal. This increases or normalizes the ratios of carbon dioxide within their bodies and uh, the asthma symptoms and the asthma condition itself subsides. One convert, Nick Jacob, had such bad asthma he couldn't play with his son and needed drugs frequently. Since learning the Buteco technique, he hasn't used the drugs and claims it's changed his life. Within three days of being on the course and practicing the technique, stopped taking Ventolin totally from using it at least eight times a day. And I haven't taken it since in six months or so, not once. The medical establishment has traditionally relied on drugs for treating the symptoms of asthma, and most doctors don't believe the Buteco method works. Despite some promising tests, it's not been scientifically proven, and the National Asthma Campaign fears some sufferers might wrongly think they've been cured. I've heard of cases of people who've been free of symptoms for 20 years and have thrown away their drugs um, and have then had a serious asthma attack and ended up in hospital or in some cases even died. That's, that's the worry about asthma, that it's variable, it comes and goes. Um, people don't really understand enough about it. Research now suggests that we may be overestimating. In Australia, the Buteco method led to national controversy about overprescription of asthma drugs. Here, the asthma campaign's advice is not to spend £300 on an unproven treatment, yet many who've tried it seem convinced. I'm surprised by the simplicity of the technique and the results that you get from these simple exercises, definitely. I think it's brilliant because I went to my doctor with asthma hoping he was going to cure me, but all they did was put me on drugs and more drugs and more drugs. If the Bruteco method were proved reliable, it would be a huge blow to the £300 million industry in asthma drugs. But while it appears to help some, doctors agree until proper trials are carried out, no one should throw away drugs which could save their lives. James Westhead reporting on the latest technique to fight asthma. 
Well, on to sport now, and the incredible summer's activity continued today with the start of the Wimbledon Tennis Championships. Can England's tennis players match the success of our footballers? Well, Jonathan Wills reports now from the leafy SW19. Well, early days so far, and our two biggest hopes, Greg Rosetsky and Tim Hemman, are in action tomorrow. But win or lose, it matters not because Wimbledon is as special as ever. They camp and queue in their hundreds, and for some the vigil began two days ago. No doubt in their minds, though, that it's worth the wait. Agassiz. Agassiz, yeah, yeah whoa. Well. He's <laughs> He's lovely. Sleeping on the pavement, telling a few jokes, having a laugh. That's a great atmosphere. I like it. No, I like it this way. We like it. I think it's, it's real uh, informal. It's it a lot of fun. The, makes the sport interesting. But there are losers as well. Parking is a nightmare. Residents are angry. The shops have changed because the rents have gone up and uh, the parking is dreadful I mean we've got cars down there but you can't even put your own car in let alone take it out and as I said it has changed and Wimbledon people don't like the tennis this year the traffic will be swollen by an exclusive taxi service 90 cars and 40 buses will move 7,000 people a day there are nearly 300 carefully vetted drivers like Terry Johnson a retired police officer driving is just one of the tasks I once drove Mr. McEnroe down from London, um, he wasn't perhaps in the best of moods and I recall that he put the radio on and a disc jockey was playing a variety of uh, tunes and a bit of banter and then suddenly he said, hey, what do you think of Wimbledon? I see McEnroe's playing this afternoon, I reckon he'll lose. Well, I've got to say that didn't go down too well in the car. While the residents may decide to take two weeks holiday while the championships are on, others like this nearby tennis club are happy to be overrun. This is where the stars fine-tune their game, perhaps Britain's only Euro 96 free zone. Well, from a playing point of view, the weather has hardly been ideal. Overcast, fairly cool and a winter match. Now in the men's singles, Pete Sampras, the defending champion, is looking to make it four in a row. In the women's, Steffi Graf is favourite. But for one Surrey favourite, Jeremy Bates, it's almost time to say goodbye in this, his last championship. Greg Whelan reports. Familiar face at every All England Championship since 1982, the former British number one was desperate to bow out in style. But in his way, the Venezuelan Nicolas Pereira and soon the Surrey players' hopes of getting through day one were in jeopardy. He lost 6-2 in the first set, 6-3 in the second, but there were brief glimpses of the Bates of old as he battled to stay in touch with the South American in the third. Oh, it Another loose return ended Bates' Wimbledon dream. Nevertheless, he was given a standing ovation at the end on court 14, ironically the scene of his greatest Wimbledon triumph, victory four years ago over Michael Chang. There was first round disappointment too today for Essex's Sam Smith, who lost in three sets to the Romanian Irina Spelea. But Britain's biggest hopes begin their Wimbledon campaigns tomorrow. Greg Rosetsky faces Canadian Daniel Nesta, and he'll be looking at least to match last year's performance when he bowed out in round four to the eventual champion Pete Sampras. Tim Henman has risen through the ranks dramatically to replace Rosetsky as Britain's number one. But to survive round one, he faces the onerous task of defeating the Russian fifth seed, Evgeny Kafelnikov. Twelve months ago, the Oxford-based player suffered the embarrassment of disqualification from Wimbledon for accidentally hitting a ball girl. It all ended in smiles, but he'll still be keen to put that bad memory behind him. Well, a change of sport now, and no Euro 96, but staying with football. And Chelsea have today announced that they've signed the French international defender, Frank Leboeuf. No ban expected on the 28-year-old defender, who will cost Chelsea a record two and a half million pounds. While in rugby, and for a fraction of the price, the North London club Saracens have completed the transfer of the English scrum half, Kieran Bracken. Bracken joins a Frenchman, Philippe Seller, and Australia's Michael Liner. Well, that's it. Day two tomorrow, Greg Rosetsky and Tim Hemman are in action, all on BBC Television. Thanks, Jonathan. Wimbledon's weather. Let's ask Suzanne Charlton. Thanks, Tim. We'll have a look at the outlook for Wimbledon in just a moment. First of all, what's happened today? Those cloudy skies, not only at Wimbledon, but over most of the region. For much of the day, we had a lot of clouds streaming in our way from the north. But as you can see here, the clearer weather is on its way right across the region now. We've got some fairly fine and sunny scenes outside across towards the centre of London there. Even the last light shower disappearing from the Kent coast 
fine and uh, really quite sunny this evening then, leading to a clear night, not too cold. Lowest temperatures in the centre of town, 11 or 12 degrees, maybe as low as 8 or 9 in some of the rural areas. Very light breezes, fine and sunny for tomorrow. Temperatures up to around 22, maybe 23 out towards Oxford. A little bit more cloud in the east though. The outlook for Wimbledon, well maybe cucumber sandwiches on Wednesday, more of the sunshine for the strawberries on Thursday, and not too bad if you're queuing for the next couple of nights. Back to Gwenan. Keep our fingers crossed. Thanks very much, Suzanne. And now look at the main BBC headlines. Labour has been spelling out its plans for getting the unemployed off welfare benefits and back into work. They include tailor-made advice and assistance for individual job seekers and giving the unemployed more say on how their entitlements should be used. And the chairman of the British Medical Association has said the NHS is sinking like the Titanic because of chronic underfunding. He called on the government to increase spending by £6 million over the next five years. That's the way it is in London and the South East tonight. We'll both be back tomorrow at the same time. Do join us then. Goodbye. Goodbye.